Tuberous sclerosis is an autosomal dominant disorder without any racial nor gender predilection. The prevalence is estimated at 1 in 6 to 1 in 11,000. It has a high rate of spontaneous mutation, meaning that approximately one quarter to one half of the patients do not have a known family history. However, there is a very high penetrance on imaging and the sporadic cases may have been overreported. Two different genes are involved, tuberous sclerosis complex one on chromosome nine and TSC2 on chromosome 16. The patients present commonly with seizures, facial angiofibromas, macular areas of depigmentation, cortical and subependymal hamartomas, about one in seven will develop a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. The majority of patients as they age will develop renal angiomyolipomas in cysts. Some of the patients will develop a smooth muscle infiltration in the lung called pulmonary lymphangioliomatosis. Again, approximately 100% of the patients have lesions affecting the skin. Retinal hamartomas, which are composed of benign astrocytes, are seen in one-third to one-half of the patients. Uh, almost 90% of the patients have central nervous system disorders. The kidney is affected in about 80% of the patients as they age. Children may present with cardiac rhabdomyomas, and pulmonary lymphangioliomyomatosis can occur in some series up to 80% of patients. That has a distinct female predilection. Tuberous sclerosis can be diagnosed by a complex set of major features and minor features. This is my Smyrniotopolis go to hell slide. No one needs to remember all of these lists. All you need to do is know some common features that will prompt you to contact Dr. Google to be able to look up the diagnostic criteria. So let's go over some of the common features that will stimulate your interest in conducting a thorough search to see if the patient has tuberculosis. The lesion on the face has been called adenoma sebaceum. That is actually a misnomer. These are raised or papular lesions composed of fibroblasts and blood vessels. They're called angiofibromas. The angiofibromas are also called Pringles disease and Pringles disease is sometimes an eponym for the entire tuberous sclerosis complex disorder. These are not present at birth. They typically develop before puberty and they will affect the nasolabial fold that may spread into a bimalar distribution. We can see in this young child who's being prepped to have a ventriculoperitoneal shunt placed to control hydrocephalus caused by a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, that these lesions are very commonly seen as reddish bumps. They may be mistaken for acne vulgaris in a patient who has already gone through puberty. If you do your own shopping, you should be able to use this picture to be able to remember some of the important features of tuberous sclerosis. Think about the Pringles potato chip can. You have the Pringles name, which is an eponym for the entire disease or just the facial lesion. If you look closely, you can see mild mental retardation. We can see the bimalar reddish rash. If you watch the commercials on television, the patients are oftentimes have Jacksonian seizures. If you read the ingredients on a Pringles potato chip can, you'll notice that the potatoes were too hard to be sliced, so they were made into potato flour. And Pringles come in a tubular can, which sounds like the word tuberous. Tuberous sclerosis patients, almost the opposite of patients who have NF1, have areas of decreased pigmentation. This is not caused by a decrease in the number of melanocytes, but rather by a decrease in the size of the pigment granules, the melanosomes. The classic lesion is a uh, ash leaf spot which is pointed at one end and oval at the other. But some patients also have a pattern that looks like confetti or inverse freckles. If you see here in this patient, this is that confetti-like hypopigmentation. 
In patients who have very fair skin, you may need to use an ultraviolet or woods lamp to reveal the areas of decreased pigmentation. Patients who have tuberous sclerosis may develop retinal hamartomas. These are composed of astrocytes. Astrocytes are a normal component of the histology of the retina. After all, the retina is actually part of the central nervous system, and the optic nerve is actually a white matter tract. It's not actually a nerve at all. This can cause the patient to have leukocoria, and if a patient presents with a history of familial leukocoria, people oftentimes are worried about the possibility of inherited retinoblastoma. How can we tell the difference between the retinal hamartoma and the more ominous retinoblastoma? There are several features that are different between these two disorders. The astrocytic hamartoma of tuberous sclerosis are oftentimes very well marginated. They don't invade into the layers of the eye. Again, you can see here that they are a sessile raised area on the surface of the retina but they may contain calcification, which makes it also more likely to be mistaken for retinoblastoma. But how are these hamartomas different from retinoblastoma? Well, they're inherited in an autosomal, domal, autosomal dominant fashion. Some of the patients have a family history, some of them don't. The patients with tuberous sclerosis as well as inherited retinoblastoma may have multiple bilateral lesions. They may develop calcification, but the important difference is that the tuberous sclerosis hamartomas are indolent lesions that may only cause the patient to have a blind spot. In contrast, retinoblastoma lesions are aggressive, they are infiltrating, they can have hemorrhage, and they can have necrosis. Very, very different prognosis for the patient. What does tuberous sclerosis do to the cerebral hemisphere? It produces these disorganized enlargements of the brain that actually look like tubers. They look like small potatoes. And that's actually the origin of the term tuberous sclerosis. What we can appreciate in the picture is if we palpate these focal areas of enlargement, we'll notice that they are much more firm to the touch. They are sclerotic. And if we look on the CT scan, we can see that sometimes these cortical tubers contain dystrophic calcifications. Patients who have tuberous sclerosis complex will also have cortical tubers and subependymal nodules. If we remember that the white color of the white matter is due to the reflection of light off of myelin bundles, we identify that this large cortical tuber does not have myelinated nerve fibers entering into it and hence has a different color from the adjacent normal white matter. This patient also exhibits subependymal nodules which are attached to the caudate nucleus along the lateral margin of the lateral ventricle. Patients who have multiple cortical tubers probably carry one of the two tuberous sclerosis gene mutations. If we look here at this beautiful rad path correlation, we can see that the absence of myelination in the cortical tuber causes a relative hypointensity on the T1-weighted MR and hyperintensity on the T2-weighted MR as the lipid signal is replaced by a water signal. So if a patient has multiple cortical tubers and multiple subependymal nodules, they're virtually guaranteed to have tuberous sclerosis. Nothing else will cause this. The differential diagnosis for the subependymal nodules includes subependymal gray matter heterotopia, but those patients would not also have the cortical tubers, which we see in this case. The subependymal nodules may contain dystrophic calcification that can be visualized on a plain radiograph. And we can see here on the CT scan these densely calcified nodules protruding into the lumen of the lateral ventricle. We were able to, in one situation, to get the pathologist to cut the brain in the axial plane instead of the normal coronal plane. And we can see multiple nodular protrusions into the lateral ventricle along the body of the caudate nucleus. 
These were called candle gutterings in the old days of Newman cephalography, and unfortunately we're stuck with that term candle gutterings to describe these lumpy bits protruding into the lateral. We can see here in these coronal images how we have these relatively bland appearing nodular protrusions into the ventricle, and unlike most hamartomas, the subependymal nodules of tuberous sclerosis often show contrast enhancement. This can make the distinction between a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma a little bit more difficult. The subependymal nodules are developmental, so they are present at birth. They can be seen on intrauterine sonography as well as postnatal sonography. And again, these nodular protrusions look like wax that is hardened along the side of a candle, like candle gutterings. We can see in this newborn that the subependymal nodules do not have the same signal intensity as the normal gray matter. That can be a differential feature between subependymal hamartomatous nodules and gray matter subependymal heterotopia. The heterotopia should be iso-intense to gray matter on all pulse sequences. So how do these occur? Jim Barkovich, one of the world's most foremost neuroradiologists, has suggested that tuberous sclerosis is the result of a disorder of both neuronal migration and maturation. Most of the cells are formed in the highly vascular germinal matrix, which is located at the corner between the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle. In the normal migration, the postmitotic neuroblasts migrate out to populate the cerebral cortex. If something goes wrong with the cellular programming, some of these cells will be left behind at the corner of the lateral and third ventricle as a subependymal nodule. And if the programming is confusing, they'll form a disorganized mass in the cerebral cortex and form a cortical tuber. The axial T2 weighted MR shows us the cortical tubers, but also shows us the trail left behind by the abnormal migration of the postmitotic neuroblast. This is a streak of demyelination that changes the signal intensity on the MR and also changes the color of the brain on the gross specimen. The cortical tuber also demonstrates the abnormal coloration. About one in seven patients who has tuberous sclerosis is at risk for developing a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Even though these are WHO grade one circumscribed gliomas, they almost invariably show contrast enhancement. They're most likely to occur at the corner of the lateral and the third ventricle near the foramen of Monroe. They're attached to the caudate nucleus head, but they're not infiltrating into the brain. And as a circumscribed glioma, they can be resected for cure. The primary morbidity from these lesions is their ability to obstruct the foramen of Monroe and cause hydrocephalus. These may now be treated with inhibitors for mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin. And the current therapy uses Averolimus, which is the same drug that's used on eluding stents for coronary artery disease. How do we tell the difference between a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma and a normal subependymal nodule? Well, typically the subependymal astrocytomas are going to be larger in diameter, but both the hamartoma and the neoplasm are going to cause contrast enhancement. There's really no good way to tell them apart in imaging except for the size and the presence of symptoms in the patient or obstructive hydrocephalus will determine whether the patient needs to have surgery regardless of what we think the lesion is on our imaging. And again, these may be treated with uh, Averolimus or other inhibitors of mTOR. Patients who have tuberous sclerosis are at increased risk for developing renal angiomyolipomas. As you remember, these are a mixture of blood vessels, muscle, and mature adult fat. We can see on the uh, renal arteriogram, the heterogeneous uh, world nephrogram effect. We can see on the gross specimen, the fatty color of the large angiomyolipoma, but this patient also had innumerable angiomyolipomas. When a patient has multiple fatty masses in the kidney, it's very, very likely that they are all angiomyolipomas and very likely that the patient has tuberous sclerosis. 
The angiomyelipoma is the most common benign renal neoplasm. The vast majority are sporadic lesions with a distinct female predilection of four to one. Sometimes the sporadic tumors have the same mutation that we see in the patients who have tuberous sclerosis complex, but only about 20% of patients who have an angiomyelipoma have tuberous sclerosis. There's a small risk of renal cell carcinoma. The primary complication is the vascular component causing a retroperitoneal hemorrhage. And angiomyelipomas that are larger than eight centimeters may need to be embolized or resected to prevent a catastrophic hemorrhage. Angiomyelipomas typically have sufficient fat to be seen on imaging as a fat-containing mass. Usually in tuberous sclerosis, the patients will have multiple very peripheral fat-containing lesions. And again, the size criteria of uh, embolizing or resecting larger than eight centimeters and watchful waiting for four to eight centimeters in diameter. These may also be treated with Averolimus. So most of the lesions that we see in tuberous sclerosis will respond to the systemic chemotherapy of the mTOR inhibitor. The last lesion I want to talk about for tuberous sclerosis is the cardiac rhabdomyomas. These uh, are a major cause of morbidity. They primarily are going to affect uh, young children uh, who have tuberous sclerosis. They will, uh, in some patients, uh, fade away on their own, but they can cause arrhythmias, which in some patients are fatal. And these lesions can also be treated with Averolimus.